Hey, you guys, what's going on? Yep. It's Sunday, and we're back again. New lighting. We, we survived. Yep. <laughs> oh, shit. Holy shit, dude. Oh, shit. Stop it. What's funny is they want... <laughs> I couldn't turn the volume down because I was getting a damn notification of something on fucking... Man, you got, you got all kind of problems. That shit is fucked up. <laughs> yeah. That shit is fucked up. I'm telling you, that's the story of my life. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, Anthony says periwinkle. Yeah, that's definitely the color that uh, of the caravan that they wanted. But yeah, so uh, Xanada is here, so that's good. Yeah. Uh, because Xanada is the one that sent us this movie, as well yep. as the last one, Lock, Sock, and Two Smoking Barrels. So as I said, this was Guy Ritchie's second film after Lock, Sock, and Brad Pitt ended up being in this because after Lock, Sock came out, Brad Pitt called Guy Ritchie up and said, "Hey, whatever your next movie is, I want to be in it." So they let him be in it. And Brad Pitt, I mean... <laughs> he's good in it. He's really good. Yeah. He's fucking iconic. I kind of feel like this... I saw this movie in the theater. This came out in 2000. And I saw this in the theater when it came out, and I remember really liking it. Like, I remember it being really funny. I hadn't seen it again since then, so I had forgotten, like, a lot of, of the crazy plot twists and everything. But I think Brad Pitt made probably the largest impression, like, on a lot of people, just because of his crazy accent. Which was kind of sounded like an Irish accent. But, it, I mean, it wasn't supposed to sound exactly like an Irish accent because he's supposed to be an Irish traveler kind of person. Kind of like an so, Irish gypsy or so something. The, so, yeah, so they don't, they don't sound exactly like Irish. So And also part of the joke, too, was that he was supposed to be kind of mush-mouthed or like nobody knew what he was saying. Yeah. So I think that was kind of like part of the joke. Xanada said, I only saw this once, but I remember liking it a lot. I'm also a huge Benicio Del Toro fan. He's a great actor. Yeah, I love him too. He's awesome. And to be honest, I had forgotten how not in this much he is. Like, well, because the cast of this is so huge, and there's, like, a bunch of different groups of people, like, kind of all doing things out, you know, at the same time. And so he's just, like, one little cog in this whole, like, machine of what's going on. So he's really only in it in the beginning because spoiler alert he gets killed like probably not even like halfway through the movie yeah. right because he gets shot by like the russian dude but uh <laughs> but yeah uh xana said light looks good yeah we've got new um we got a new ring light and stuff we're mostly we're using it for the other project but i said well i'm gonna throw it over here and see what it looks like and because i can't i want to get another ring light that we can like do lower down because it's kind yeah. of like high up you know what i mean because i'm telling you like a lot of the photos and shit like that that I took yesterday with the ring light, I was like, holy crap. I was like, I need to get a ring light that I can just like carry around with me all the time and <laughs> like shine on my face because I was like, ooh, that soft pink light. I was like, look how fucking angelic I look. It's like, I don't even look like me anymore. I'm like, that's pretty awesome. I need yeah, one of those. Yeah, here's an example. I need one of those to like carry around with me. Yeah, that's that's an example of, of how that ring light shit can. Yeah, you're extremely it's, flattering. Oh, it's all the damn. Yeah. <laughs> Very flattering. Yeah, so I was like, oh, now I know why everybody buys those. Yeah. Because, like, all the pictures came out. I'm like, holy crap, I look like a fucking child. I really <laughs> I really need to, like, uh, yeah. So it was like, she passed for 20. That's what I mean. Yeah. It's like, I, not in, in real life, I can't, but it's like, yeah, and then photos with, like, <laughs> not photos 20, with no. that. No, no way. No. People, some people thought you were in your 30s. Yeah, I have yeah. had people think I was in my, like, yeah. mid-30s, but yeah. In real life, but yeah. not not so much. Not so much. 20. No way. Uh, but yeah. Tammy says, new wig looks really good. Yes, this is a new one. This is one of the ones that I got from uh, from Sheehan. Yeah, and it's got gray in it. Yeah. I, I kind of dug it. Oh, yeah, I was yeah, just yeah, kind of yeah. like, I kind of like the... Yeah, it looks good. It's kind of like hot old lady energy. Yeah. I'm, I'm into it. She's also got a mom wig, too. A little, well, that was, the, that was in that picture. Yeah, yeah. That was yeah. in that picture. She, she looks good in it. I said, I we did a scene in it. It looks good. I said, it looks like mom hair, but I was yeah. like, he's like, but not in a bad way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was the idea. Yeah. Well, you know... Hot mom hair. In that, in, in that particular genre, it's... A woman's got to... If, she, if she's working alone, or mostly alone, I'm in it, um, she has to be multiple characters. And that it's, it's like fucking cosplay. If not, the channel gets boring. That's how everybody else does it, and that's that's the best way to do it. Yeah, it's yeah. like farting around with different wigs. Yeah, you're not always yourself. Stuff. You're going to be somebody else. And yesterday, if you saw that picture, like I had blue contacts in too. Yep. 
Cause you my, got blue contacts, Because my contacts. eyes are not blue. Going to get a, gonna get a um, that particular company, you can buy contacts in a set of 10 and get a real good deal out of them. I'm, I'm going to do that. Chesney's random and useless collection of things says, very bright of Frankenstein letting her hair down. Yeah, see, I, li I like that too. I like that too. All right, so uh, we only just now finished watching Snatch, like literally like half an hour ago, because we didn't have time. We were shooting some stuff last night. Normally we would watch the movies on Saturday night and then, you know, give me time to like research them and stuff the next day. But we didn't have time last night because we were, you know, shooting a scene and it went like way over. And so we didn't have time to watch it because we weren't done until like 11 or 12. And then, um, then I had a bunch of other shit I had to do today. So we didn't get to watch the movie until like literally a couple of hours ago. <laughs> so yeah. we only just finished watching it like literally half an hour it's ago. It's a good movie. I liked it. Yeah. Um, did we, I, I think I like this one slightly better than Lockstock. They're very similar. Yeah, they, they're, the same, they're similar. Right? I mean, they don't have, the, it's not the same plot really, but I mean, it's kind of like the same setup where you have like all of these seemingly disparate uh groups of criminals like all doing their own little shit and then it all like intertwines and then like ends up being like a big thing in the end and so in that sense it is very similar and again i kind of feel like if you weren't paying attention just kind of like in lockstock it's hard to keep track of everything because it's a very large cast and it's kind of like a very, I don't think it's, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'd say it's that complicated. There's really just kind of like two main plots going on, right? There's just like the diamond, like the 84 karat diamond or whatever it is that's stolen. So there's that whole thing. And then, and everybody trying to get hold of that. And then there's the whole uh, boxing promoter thing going on. And then like at the end, and some of the people like are involved in both things, but they, then it kind of just like ties up at the end. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I keep getting kicked off the internet. Is that thing running? No. You're not, it's not pretty? Okay. No. Not me. It's not doing anything. It was, it was running a while ago. Uh, Xanada said, be honest, was it good? I haven't seen this one in years, so I was kind of shooting yeah. in the dark when I sent it. Yeah, yeah. I actually, um, I like this one a little bit better than, because I found the um, the crime, I, some of the gags were funnier, um, and I kind of feel like, um, I kind of felt, I liked the whole like uh, undercover, like underground boxing thing and the whole diamond thing. Like I, I liked those a lot better than the crime at the that they did in Lockstock, but they're both really good. I mean, they're both like I said, really similar, but you know, and they're shot the same in that kind of like crazy, uh, you know, real kinetic style like he would do, which was really like influential. But I think a lot of when this came out, I feel like a lot of critics complained because they're like, oh well, it's just like Lockstock and Two Smoking Barrels, which like I said, it is, but. I'm I'm not mad at it. I'm just well. It's just because like Lockstock was good, and it's like that's the kind of movies that he likes to make. He likes to make like crime based dark comedies. He's doing the same thing Tarantino was doing, right? And that's it's all. like you know, no one really I mean, pissed him on about. Well, they probably yeah, did piss him on about that. Yeah, he was just a director, and, and, and you know, it was doing his own style, and it was gangster stuff, and you know, Tarantino was doing the same thing, but they had very different styles. The two, not very different. They're different, though. Yeah, the tones, yeah. Are, the tones are very different. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I do kind of feel like a lot of times Guy Ritchie kind of gets called, oh, like, the British Tarantino, which I guess is true, like, in a very shallow sense. Yeah. In the, you know, like I said, in the sense that they're making kind of, like, crime caper movies that are, like, yeah. dark comedies with a bunch of interconnected yeah. plot lines. And it's kind of a Pulp Fiction type Right, stories. like I get that, but other than that, like you said, tonally it's very different. They're yeah. very British, which is what yeah. I like about them. Um... And I think I like, because some of the same actors in this, like Jason Statham is in this one too. Um, Vinny Jones is in this one too. And I actually think I, I like Vinny Jones' character a bit better in this one, just because he doesn't get as much screen time as he does in Lockstock. But I just really like the couple of scenes that he's in, especially that scene um, toward the end where he's confronting the two uh, kind of small-time hoods, like Lenny James and the other guy, where you know they have like the fake pistols and he sees yeah. that they're like replicas on the side and he's yeah. like all intimidating and stuff. And I love that his teeth are like bullets because that was kind of his whole thing was he got fucking, <laughs> those, those are like the, they're his bullet tooth Tony or whatever his name is. Like everybody has cool names like that. You know what yeah. I mean? Like Jason Statham's character is called Turkish because he says at the beginning it was like named after a plane crash right like somebody was in a plane crash and he was named after the airline which was like turkish airlines yeah. so he got named after that and then everybody has names like fucking uh yeah like bullet tooth tony and fucking 
uh, Frankie Four Fingers. Yeah. That's Benicio del Toro's character because he's like a gambler, and I guess he kept like losing a bunch of money, so like he would lose money and like they would cut his fingers off like for punishment and shit like that. Yeah, and in the tradition of his other movie, okay, and a lot of the British gangster movies that I've seen, the gangsters, the characters, don't know anything about guns. Uh, they say fucking crazy shit about guns that isn't true. They admit to not know anything about guns. They don't know how to practice with them. Um, they, uh, <laughs> if you were, if all you knew about guns, or you were learning from British gangster movies, you wouldn't know anything. <laughs> but there are some cool guns in it. I know I got gun guys in the audience. Um, they had a Spas 12 shotgun that had been cut down with a fucking short and fucking magazine tube underneath it. And it looks wicked as shit. Uh, just a famous shotgun from the 80s. Same one fucking the Terminator was using in Terminator 1 to shoot at the police station. That look, that shotgun looked mean as shit. There wasn't much to it, though, really, you know. N- nothing compared to, say, something magazine-fed like a Saiga 12. Um, it was just kind of wicked looking. I think that think in, in, in the version that they showed couldn't have carried any more than five rounds. Um... Main bad guy there uh, has a Desert Eagle 50. Yeah, and, Bullet Tooth Tony. Yeah, that, Bullet Tooth yeah. Tony, which I fired him in 357 Magnum. I fired him in 44 Magnum, and I fired him in 50. And he shoots that 50 in this in this <laughs> in this uh, movie. Of course, it's blank firing. You know, it's not the real thing. But uh, he rapid fires it like it's nine millimeter. And if if you've ever shot what a fucking Desert Eagle 50s like, no, it's fucking wicked. Uh, it's not something you could rapid fire. The forty four Magnum is about like shooting a fucking 1911-45. Even that's kind of tough to rapid fire, but uh, fucking 50 is like even more of a fucking boom, boom, you know, fucking slow. A lot of high, kind of high recoil, but soft and long. It takes place over a long time. Um, they had some interesting, uh, they had an interesting fucking HK, it looked like an HK P7. Might have been the P14, but it's hard to tell. And uh, some kind of a Steyr. I think I think it was I think that was a Steyr GB. I think is what they called it. Which was, and in this movie, it turns out that they were actually blank firing replicas. Yeah, they didn't. They weren't the real thing. They didn't have it. That was how they got hold of yeah. them. Because like I said, the two guys they were kind of like small time hoods, and they yeah. worked at a pawn shop, and they were in over their heads. Yeah, I don't know of any blank firing replicas. Maybe Japan made something like that. I mean, they made replicas of just everything. It's things that we. What's funny is that in America, you can get those guns. That's all legal. And easy to get. As long as you're not a felon, you pass a background check, you can get it. You could never sell a replica like that, though. Uh-uh, not here in the United States. Because <laughs> that's too close to the real thing. And they don't want people fucking walking around with something like that. You'll get shot. You know. Um, that matter of fact, there were some replica AR-15s that were, I think they were um, some kind of a uh, paintball, not paintball, what do you call it? Airsoft. Yeah, uh, an airsoft AR-15s, and they wouldn't let them in because the lower receiver, which is the bottom part of the gun that carries all the trigger parts, was an exact replica. So here you could just put the full auto parts in it, and there's your full auto machine gun. Because we have the real uppers and the lowers and everything else to activate that. It was the correct aluminum, and it was the exact correct shape. It would accept full auto parts. So they wouldn't let that in, and that was something from Japan. Because um, they don't have guns over there, so they're not worried about somebody activating something. You know, over here you can activate. No, although over, over here you can get machine guns legally too, so it's not really a big deal. Most people aren't really that interested in them because of why and how machine guns or full autos work. They're not that attractive, really. Their full auto selector switches on military firearms really only exist because the semi-auto trigger is so shitty you can't pull it very quickly. So you flip it over to a full auto selection and it'll pull the trigger for you. Um, but you can now drop in semi-auto triggers that are so sweet, you can pull that trigger just about as fast as a machine gun can fire. Um, but British flicks always kind of fucking trip me out with the shit that the characters say about guns. It's just whoever's writing doesn't know what the fuck they're talking about. Well, and the thing, too, yeah. is that a lot of the joke of Guy Ritchie's movies yeah. is that these are criminals that don't... I mean, it's a black comedy, yeah, so they, it's they like don't know they, anything. They don't really know yeah. what they're doing, and they don't really... Yeah. So a lot of the humor kind of comes from their cluelessness. Yeah. Although I will say, one of my favorite... like, And, it's, and they don't even... 
um, like lean too hard into this, but, but this just like made me laugh. Was the scene toward the end where Bullet Tooth Tony, where there's that big confrontation like in that hallway, and yeah. Bullet Tooth Tony's like shooting everybody with that Desert Eagle, yeah. and he shoots Boris the Blade, like the Russian guy, yeah. and they had made. And they didn't reference this, like, later on in the movie, so they were counting on you to remember. But earlier on in the movie, like, re- way near the beginning, they were talking about Boris the Blade, and it's, like, how, like, it was impossible to kill him or something like that. So, like, at the end, when, when Bullet Tooth Tony is, like, shooting him, and he's, like, off screen, but he's, like, shooting at him, and it's, like, he shoot him, and then there's, like, a couple seconds of quiet, and then you hear Boris, like, say something, and then he just keeps, like, fucking shooting him, and he won't fucking die. And yeah. it's, like, and they don't show Boris, which makes it funnier to me. Like, it's just, like, a couple seconds of silence, and he's, like, and then he'll still say something crazy, like, he's not yeah. dead yet. And then he's, like, would you just die? And it's, like, that just made me laugh. Because it's, like, they, like I said, they didn't reference that. They referenced that one time, like, towards the beginning yeah. of the movie that he was, like, impossible to kill. And, and I thought that there, was funny. There are, there, you know, the whole Desert Eagle angle that she's talking about, There, that is... On the American side of, of of the audience watching that, especially the action side, the guys that like action movies, there's kind of a joke about the Desert Eagle. The Desert Eagle was a fine pistol, all right? It was big, it was heavy, it wasn't something you could really conceal. It came out of the 70s in Israel where they were trying to make a police pistol that could fire three to seven Magnum that was semi-auto, that had no recoil that their female officers could carry. And it did that, all right? It was big light recoiling in 357 you could rapid fire it it was great really and it kind of made sense in that caliber but when hollywood got a hold of that pistol especially when it became 44 magnum that thing was in every fucking action movie it yeah, became a that. meme yeah uh, the the fucking desert eagle is the mullet of fucking pistols all right that's it, a good yeah it's the mullet of pistols that's 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 yeah. a good analogy <laughs> That's a good analogy. Everybody fucking... Every movie had that thing in it. Yeah. And they weren't cheap, though. I'm not saying they were cheap. It's just that they were stereotypical. You know, they were... They were they were a meme. It was They were meme cannons. That's what yeah, they were. Yeah, meme cannon. <laughs> they were a meme cannon. Fire off the memes. Fire off... It's the meme cannon. That's what it was. Uh, they were good, though. But, just, but like you said, it seemed like Guy Ritchie knew that. And yeah. it's like, that's why he specifically yeah. made that, like, kind of like a little bit of a plot yeah. point. Yeah. That would be the last thing you'd want to carry in combat is a fucking Desert Eagle 50. That same weight you could carry an AR-15 carrying 30 rounds. You can't conceal either one, so why? it's outside the range of a pistol, so you might as well just make it a rifle. That thing's fucking huge. I couldn't conceal that, and that's all pistols are for, is concealment. If you can't conceal it, then it's useless. Well, might as well just be waving it, it, it might, around. Might as well just have a rifle. <laughs> so, you know, it's good for hunting, though. Uh, and the Israelis didn't care about concealment because it was going to ride in a holster for a policeman, you know. But uh, in the U.S., some places like here in Florida, you can you got constitutional carry. You know, everyone has a right to carry a weapon here, but not in the open. It's got to be concealed. They don't want people on, on the hip walking around. Other states is exactly re- the reverse. It just depends on how people interpret safety, you know. Uh, you couldn't, you can't consider, you can't conceal a fucking desert eagle. It's heavy. Santa yeah. said the desert eagles are always gold plated in the movies. Yeah, too, it yeah. Seems like <laughs> gold plated. And then Tyler, the guy said uh, the video game character Duke Nukem, uh, who was a satire of '80s action heroes, and his signature weapon was a big ass golden desert eagle. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's why. Like, yeah, that's what we were talking about. Yeah. Like that, it, it almost became like a cliche, yeah. like in action movies, yeah. which, and, like I said, is why they probably put it in this movie. And the mullet of submachine guns is a Tech Nine. <laughs> <laughs> like out of big, tr- big trouble in Little China. You just see Tech Nines everywhere, and uh, the American ones were all fucking semi-auto. But the original one was the KG. I think it was called a KG ninety nine or Intertech ninety nine. I think is what it was called originally. It's some Swiss fucking company, and it was full auto. But they didn't have them here. They don't think they ever imported any of them. Good thing the bolts cracked on them. They did. They weren't really made to last. But yeah. Um. But. Bullet Tooth Tony's character is great. I mean, Jason Statham's character is great. All the characters are really good, like, are really interesting. I love, also, that they have Dennis Farina in this, who, um, I mean, he was in a shit ton of stuff. But remember, he did Unsolved Mysteries for a while, like, after uh, Robert Stack died. Do you remember he was, yeah. like, the, the thing of that? And he's just playing this kind of, like, um, he's like a Jewish gangster. He was the one that um, is comes to London to get the to get the diamond. Mm-hmm. And it's like, so that's a whole funny thing, like a whole funny, like 
culture clash type of thing because yeah. he's just like this mouthy New Yorker and he comes to England and he just can't stand anything. It's like, I thought you guys invented this language and you don't even speak it because he, he doesn't know like any of their slang or anything like that because he says something got blagged and he's like, what the fuck does that mean? Um, and yeah, and I was going to say like Brad Pitt is fucking great in this too. He got like pretty ripped for this. I think that he trained as a bare knuckle boxer for yeah. this specific movie because that's what he is in the thing although nobody knows that until later on they call him what like mickey one punch o'neill yeah. or something like that where he just like knocks everybody out like with one fucking swing yeah. and uh he he did good in this movie and he was he was looking great he looked real good he's probably at the best of his conditioning i think yeah although fight club he was pretty fucking cut too well fight club when, um, did that come out uh the same year as this same year yeah. Maybe. I, now I can't remember like yeah. when Fight Club came out, if it was later than this or yeah. earlier. And don't feel bad if your physique isn't like that. He's not natural. All right. That's at least he's on. I don't even think that's Anavar. He's probably on a mixture of Winstrol and Na Nandrolone or something, you know. He's uh, he's on shit. But probably yeah. running a testosterone base and stuff. But, uh, well, yeah, because he had to get like in really yeah. good shape for this yeah. movie. Because, like I said, he's supposed to be like a bare knuckle boxer, yeah. and he was fighting dudes that were like way bigger than him. Yeah, uh, that had like a lot of weight on him, so they had to make him look like wiry and strong enough that yeah. that was feasible that he yeah. could like, knock somebody out with one punch. Yeah, know? he's real wiry. Yeah, well, de well defined. That's what I was thinking. Winstrol, probably something like testosterone and Winstrol. Winstrol makes you real wiry look, and it's more for like endurance runners. And it can really increase definition a lot. It's hard to say what stack he was running, but he was running something. He looked great. And looking back on it, you know, he was when he was around, I was young. All my friends were young. And guys like that, guys like Brad Pitt, they don't stick out to young guys. As we get older and uglier, we can see those, <laughs> we can see those guys. He goes, man, that was a good-looking guy. Man. I wish I looked like that, you know. But uh, yeah, he uh, look. Seeing him now, I can understand why women liked him so much. Uh, he's he's a good-looking guy. Yeah. Yeah. Really. No, he's not really my type, but um, he's but I'm wild too. He's kind of got a crazy yeah, personality. You know? But I always like he's good in like pretty yeah. much every movie that yeah. he's in. I mean, he never... That's one thing he doesn't seem to, like, phone it in or anything like that. Yeah. He, and he does take interesting roles on. Yeah. Which, like I said, I thought that was really cool that he would actually be in this movie. This, Like I said, this is only Guy Ritchie's second movie, so he was still kind of... I mean, he wasn't, like, a nobody, but he wasn't, like, super yeah. famous. And I love that, you know, Brad Pitt, who was, like, even a huge star back then, he, like, went out of his way to call up this dude who had just made one movie and yeah. said, hey, I really liked your movie. I'll be in your next one, yeah. which is, like, pretty amazing. What Zanon has said about Brad Pitt, I agree. Re, re, I agree. Uh, I didn't really appreciate him at the time. Go ahead and read it. Yeah, it says, I didn't appreciate B Brad Pitt at the time. Now I think he's a great uh, actor. Great. Yeah. Now I think he's great. Great actor, too. Yeah. Yeah, he's... I really kind of... I guess... Um, I ne I've never really had, like, anything against him, necessarily, like, the same way that I do, like, Tom Cruise or something. <laughs> but, um... Because honestly, I mean, don't don't get offended, Tom. I'm still in your corner. <laughs> this Tom still loves you. Yeah, but we're, um, we're, it's a, I'm another Tom in the short man mafia. Oh, so by you, the way, if you weren't here on Friday night, um, where uh, where Zach sent, we were talking about Tom Hardy, and yeah. Zach sent Tom yeah. a picture of Tom Hardy that he had posted on his MySpace from back in the day, where he's like, he yeah. was like naked, but you could only see like his butt really, and he and his he had this amazing. Back arch. Back arch. I was like, yeah. shit, man. I just, that looks like some only contortionist that shit from right there. a female there. porn star. He was just, he was ready I for like all comes. I was just like, up like that. I'm like, that's an incredible photo. It's a, it, it's an amazing photo. It's from his fucking MySpace page yeah, back in the day. Yeah, like from back in the day. Like before he was super famous. He's nude, laying down, face like down face on down, bed. Like stomach down, And yeah. next to him is a fucking mirror, mirror. And he's touching it. And he's on the sheets and shit. And his fucking ass is arched up. It's like something. It's incredible. Like, like the something. arch is incredible. Yeah, I was just like, like, that doesn't even look real. Fuck? Yeah, it's that like, looks like Photoshop. Yeah. But um, I was like, that's amazing. I can't yeah. do that. He, but, that's how he got his job in Hollywood. But I told him like we were talking about that photo because we were talking about Tom Hardy like yeah. the other like yesterday morning or whatever. Yeah. And I said, oh my god, do you know it would be hilarious if we printed out that picture. Well, the first thing I said was, I said, let's print out that picture and frame it and put it over the bed and then take a picture of it in its frame over the bed and then send that to Zach. Like, that would be funny. <laughs> and then 
I was like, let's do that. <laughs> and then and then Tom's like, oh, you know what would be even better than that? If we took up that picture and a picture of Tom Cruise, like, in some kind of sexy, like, either from Risky Business yeah, or from we, Top Gun with a shirt off or something like that, and then put them on either side and then put a picture of Tom in the middle. So it's yeah. like the three Toms. <laughs> and then we'll hang that over the bed. And then we'll, I was like... <laughs> I was like, we gotta do that. That would be super funny. I don't know how long I'm gonna leave it there, but it was <laughs> like it would be. Sort really... of just coming up with shit. <laughs> I don't know. I just thought that yeah. was so funny that Zach had sent you that picture, and I was like, that is an yeah. amazing picture, right well, there. It's funny that Zach knew who he was back before he was famous. Yeah, I'm not real familiar with Tom Hardy's very, very early career, yeah. so I don't really know. You know, because MySpace, it, holy shit, that was a long yeah, time ago. Yeah, I guess ago. the gay dudes were up on fucking Tom Hardy before everybody else. They had advance warning. That's what I mean. I guess, man, they were like way ahead of the curve yeah. on that one. I mentioned this in another in another program when we were talking about uh, Tom Hart, some of Tom Hardy in movies. It was probably, I think I was, probably when I was talking about Legend. Either that or uh, 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 fucking Bronson. Bronson. Which I kind of want to see again, actually. Tom, you know, we're talking about it. Tom Hardy, fucking, it's hard to believe that he played those characters, and then he ended up being Bane. And I heard, you know, that he was under a lot of stress for Bane. You know what I mean? Because Batman fans are like, "Man, he'll he could never play Bane. Look at He's the size too of small. Bane." So he starts going on the juice, and he starts fucking. And evidently, he was like crying. He was having nervous fucking attacks I, about. Trying well, to get big enough to be fucking bad. Having the whole world like shitting on you before yeah. you've even like Have done it and saying shit. you can't do it, like that's pretty shitty. So he goes on all kinds of stuff, you know. I could kind of imagine what stack he's on. I've seen him train when he was in the gym training for it and um, trying to put on as much fucking weight as possible. And uh, he did it pretty good. I think yeah. I think he did pretty. I think he did good as Bane. Now, if you look at a drawing uh, from a cartoon, like a, a Bane. No man could ever be those proportions, you know, especially... You know, he's yeah, it's fucking, a cartoon. It's a cartoon. Like, it's, it's a fucking, drawing. He's huge, you know. And he's on Venom, which is a special concoctions of steroids that he invented himself. And he gets huge when he's on it. Eventually, he learns to ways to stay that big while he's not on it. But, you know, fucking... So, the character's on steroids. Mega steroids. And I just think it's fucking amazing that, you know, Tom Hardy's commitment to acting and co and commitment to, I guess you could say, self-development. When you see where he came from, early photos of him, he was like a stereotypical pretty boy. Yeah. He was like a Macaulay Culkin type. Well, Tammy says he uh, he won a modeling competition yeah. in his early days. Yeah. Yeah. And he seemed like he was very slender. Very good looking. He's a very good looking dude. Yeah. He's gay bait. You know, gay dudes would fucking love that. Yeah. Exactly. You know. But you look at him now, he's fucking pretty big, you know? Yeah. For a guy who's didn't have some kind of special fucking genetic gift to, for size, you know? It was just that random and training and fucking proper hormonal support and diet and, and willpower. You know, you got to... I got a lot of respect for him. He's a great actor. Yeah, he's, he's great, great in he's, everything. Yeah, I've he's good. Him, man. And he's just got a lot of willpower. You'd have to have willpower to get that done. So yeah. I have big respect. He really wanted that yeah. role. Only other guy, that, only other actor that has that amount of willpower than Tom Cruise. That guy's got willpower too. You might think he's a dick, but he's very skilled. Yeah, I mean, those are two different things. Yeah, I've always said, skilled. like, mad respect for as far as his career. He's like, yeah. he's. I don't think he's a great actor, actor, but he actually does. He always gives like a he's thousand a successful percent. Successful actor. Right, yeah, right, yeah. right. And you he know, can fly aircraft and ride motorcycles. Yeah, he, he can, can do, do all that, that shit. shit. He, he can does. do all his stunts and everything yeah. like that. I never shit on him. He's for good that. with guns. I just think I just think he seems like an asshole. Cruises, Cruises, is, Cruise That's is two good. different things. Cruises is good <laughs> with guns too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Zach says Tom Hardy's ass is certainly big enough to play Bane all by itself. Yeah. Hey oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Zach says uh, awesome hair, Jen. Thank you. Did you talk about the part yet where the big black dude can't get out of the car? That's my favorite part. Yeah, the big black dude was at the table playing cards with 007 in Casino Royale. That's and right. I, I, knew, I, like, oh, I knew I recognized him. I knew I recognized him. Yeah, I didn't realize that he had speaking roles in other movies. I didn't know he was a pretty famous British gangster actor. Everybody yeah. in this, like, yeah. if you've seen a lot of British films, you will recognize pretty much everybody in here. Because it's like, there. who was that Scottish dude that was in this that played, uh, what was his character's name? Mullet. He was in one scene that Bullethead Tony, like, pulled yeah. him in the car by his tie and then, like, dragged him along, like, with his head in the window. Like, that dude has been, that dude was in Train Spotting, and he was in, uh, I think he was in some Mike Lee movies, I want to say. But yeah, he's like, and part of his thing too is, I th I'm pretty sure he's Scottish and he has like a very, very thick accent. So they always kind of like 
put him in those kind of roles. You know what I mean? I think my favorite part of this, because that is great. I really like those three guys together. Cause and um Lenny James, like playing kind of like the I guess he's sort of like the brains of the operation or whatever. And he's fucking great in this. He's Lenny James is great in everything. I love him. And I feel like you well, you you had you saw him on Walking Dead. Yeah. And um no, he's great on Walking Dead. And I think you didn't realize it's that another, he was British either. Because yeah. he plays an American That's on there. Another one of you know, I fucking I give credit where credit's due, man. When it comes to the theater, the British fucking got it. At least if the if the language is English, it's gonna the British actors are the best. You know, going all the way back to the fucking William Shakespeare, man. They they, <laughs> they, they knew about theater. They're very good, and they're real actors. Yeah, Hollywood actors. Uh, yeah, some of them are into yeah. it. Some of them are into it for like the craft. Yes, yeah, of it, and some of them not so much. Some of them are into are into it because of the casting couch, and they were good at parties, and um, you know, sleeping with the right people, and politics, and yeah, no. Because you know, even an average person, you can give them some training and make them a pretty good actor. Get them through a Hollywood movie. They won't be like a fucking Shakespearean thespian actor yeah they're not gonna win any Oscars they're not gonna be anything. that but you can get them through an action flick and that's where a lot of them come from yeah cause I think a lot of them are just kinda like well I just need to know enough acting skills to like make millions of dollars and then I'm happy do this part yeah. Where, whereas you know you have people like like you said like Tom Hardy or well he's British but um yeah. or like Christian Bale or somebody like that who actually go the fucking extra mile and they're like, hey, I'm going to starve myself down to 80 yeah. pounds for this movie. Or, hey, I'm going to yeah. put on 300 pounds. Or... Christian Bale be the closest to the guys like Hardy and all those guys. Tom Cruise, too. But Yeah. Like you I have said, to be a little bit crazy, yeah. I feel. But that's kind of true of any creative endeavor. I kind of feel like all the best people at it are a little yeah. bit crazy. Tom Cruise, for financial reasons, he doesn't have a big range. He has to stick within a certain kind of role. Because that's where he, that's, his fans are going to respond to that. But I saw him in Collateral as a fucking villain. He was great. Great. He, yeah, he, he can do. He can do a role. Yeah. It's just, will he? Because that might yeah. almost be a loss of money for him. Yeah. You know. Um, Zach says, my other favorite part of this movie is Alan Ford's accent. Alan Ford plays a great fucking... He's Bricktop in this, by the way. He's a great... I love his whole big, long thing about... Uh, feeding the people to the pigs, like cutting up the bodies and yeah. feeding them to pigs. And I love that he's just sitting there very casually, like talking about it on the couch, like while his lackey like brings him a cup of tea. Yeah. Because of course it's England, so you have to have everybody like bring you a cup of tea. Even when you're talking about cutting up bodies and feeding them to pigs. I think, I don't know, I have a lot of favorite bits in this. I think my my whole favorite recurring gag is the bits with the dog. Because I love the shit, like, the dog, they get it from the quote-unquote pikeys, like the Irish traveler group, because they give him a dog with every deal, I guess. So they get this dog, and the dog pretty much immediately, like, swallows a squeaky toy, so, like, for the rest of the movie, like, every time, it's not, like, I like that it's a gag, but it's not, like, overdone, you know what I mean? And they don't, like, call a lot of attention to it, but, like, whenever the dog is in a scene, and whenever he, like, kind of moves or barks, he kind of squeaks a little bit, which I think is really funny. And then, I like, too, that the that him eating the squeaky toy near the beginning of the movie is kind of, like, pays off later on when he actually does eat the diamonds. Like, it's, like, foreshadowing. You know what I mean? So yeah. I thought that was really good. And that whole scene, too, where they find out that the dog took the diamond and swallowed it, and then they're like... So then Dennis Farina's character is, like, telling uh, Bullet Tooth Tony to cut open the dog, and he won't do it. Like, even though he, he'll kill people, like, nothing. Yeah. But they tell him, like, he's like, well, get go inside the dog. He's like, what do you mean go inside the dog? He's not a tin of baked beans. Yeah. And it's like, he won't fucking yeah. do it. I think, and that's, I think that's a, I think that's a, a, a typical fucking thing though i think that too that's why it's like it's funny kill the animal it's funny but it's like you understand it though because it's like yeah they kill people but they're other gangsters yeah you know the dog didn't do anything (laughs) the dog is innocent it's kind of a western thing you know dogs and cats are pets and horses you know they're they're, they're pets that'd be like killing a child yeah you know so that's and yeah and i think people even criminals do kind of think about that the same way yeah so that's why I kind of thought that was funny, but I liked Better that. Not who they are. I yeah. liked that too because yeah. Dennis Farina absolutely did not give a fuck. He just wanted yeah. to cut the dog open and get the diamond out because it's an eighty-four carat diamond. But I love that like the the British guy was like, no, <laughs> like I'm not fucking deal with that. He's not a tin of baked beans. Um, Tyler, the guy said the difference is in England you mainly get actors, and in America you mainly get movie stars. Yeah, I hope that makes sense the way I phrase it. And I mean, you know, we do have a lot of like actor actors here too, but it just does seem like. 
as a whole, it doesn't get. I think it doesn't get taken as seriously. Who makes it in Hollywood is very different from who's acting. You know, sort of. A, yeah, that's a that's a scene unto its own. It's like a fucking popularity contest, and you know, there's internal politics going on, and there's behind the scenes party and in relationships and shit. It's just just because a person's in, in on in a movie doing a role doesn't mean that that's the best person for that job. That's just someone yeah. who got in there. Because of the director or the producer or whatever, you know, politics. Zach says, when I see what Christian Bale does to himself for movies, I guess, um, I legit wonder what health issues he's going to have later in life and how much his doctor must hate him. Yeah, especially after he did, I was thinking after he did The Machinist, (coughs) because he essentially, I can't remember like what weight he went down to. If you haven't seen The Machinist, please see it. Holy crap. It's like, I don't think you've seen it either. It's great. But that was when Christian Bale like basically like starved himself. Like he all he said all he had ate was like gum and coffee, yeah. and he starved himself down to like nothing. He looked like a fucking living skeleton. It's horrifying, and uh, I'm you know I'm sure they enhanced it with makeup and stuff, but you can tell that that's fucking real. And then like later on, didn't he play fucking um, Dick Cheney? Yeah, in he, Vice, he, he looked just like him. and he he did, and he gained a bunch of weight for that. And I was like, oh my god. Yeah, that, I was thinking that too. I was like, "Holy shit, your doctor must." He looked just hate like you. Dick Cheney. Sounded just like him. Acts just like him. He passed Dick Cheney. It was crazy. Yeah. That was a good movie, actually. Yep. I think we saw that in the theater. <coughs> Zana said, "I told Tom I'll take a break from sending movies for a month or so, so you can do some horror movies, Jenny." Well, thank yep. you. That's nice. well, but you did send Casino, and we still got to do that. Yep. But that's I don't mind that because like I fucking love Casino, man. Yeah, because um, I definitely have been wanting to do that. That was one that I had on the list because I fucking love that movie, and I haven't seen it. I might have seen that in the theater too. Um, t- Tyler said he could also he also could fit to play Batman. Yeah, yeah. But so just like the the shit that he that man does to his body is yeah. fucking incredible. I thought he was a good Batman, and some people fucking got upset about his, his, the voice that he would put on in Batman. Yeah. And when I first heard it, I thought I liked it. The more I heard it, I was like, that's a little over the top, you know. But uh, it yeah, it is, but not my uh, much. It's slight. Yeah. It's slight. Yeah, it's it's good. Uh, th- those mo- I love those movies. Yeah, doesn't matter. If they're entertaining, you know. Yeah, I get it. I mean, and sometimes too, like Batman I think Begins was fucking my favorite one. I thought that was the best one. Yeah, I like that movie yeah. too. Those were those were the good Batmans. Yeah, but uh, but yeah. So anything else that you would like to talk about in <clears throat> regards to Snatch? Um, it's. It's just it's just a good British gangster movie. It's very entertaining. Uh, it's got violence in it. It's got a lot of humor in it. Um, yeah, there's some funny shit. In yeah, <laughs> if you've ever seen a Quentin Tarantino movie and liked that, that's very American. This is kind of like a British equivalent to that. Like it's, it's very, very it's very British. Very British. It's very British. Um, I needed subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what the fuck they were talking about. And he and he had to ask me like um a couple of times like if they were. if they used like a like a slang term. Yeah, he had to ask I was like, me what the hell's that? that? <laughs> and, um, they're doing stuff like in the uh, dropping H's off the beginning of fucking words, and I was yeah. like, what the fuck? Did he they don't say? um they don't do that everywhere. Like yeah. um that's I mean that these are said in London, so that's a Cockney thing. Yeah. Like some of the other um, accents do that too, but some of them yeah. like hit the H really hard. But a lot of them do kind of drop it. Yeah. But um, yeah. So the, it's yeah, the same language, of course. Yeah. It's just that uh, sometimes you, you don't know what the noun was. Like, you know, <laughs> I called a dude a pikey, and I was like, "What the fuck is a pikey?" Now, I don't know what that is. You know? So. Well, they did explain it after later they on. Did, yeah. They did explain so. It. I mean, I told you, you, you what it was. You may not understand the, then... no, the noun, but you kind of get the gist of what they're talking about. And over time, you go, oh, okay, I think I know what they're talking about now, what a pikey is. But she told me what it was. I would have figured it out, though. Yeah. Um, but it's just not that. Just other things. It was like, you know, what the fuck are they talking about? And then he goes, oh, okay, that's what they're talking about. Okay. <laughs> just shit like that, you know. I kind of laughed. Actually, I think this was from Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. But when one of them, he gave this big, long spe- spiel, and then at the end, he said... And Robert's your mother's brother, and that like made me laugh really, really hard. Yeah. It, because that's like, that's like a two layered <laughs> slang. Because the slang is actually and Bob's your uncle, which I don't even know where that came from, but um, but that's something that they say a lot. So I like that they were taking that already uh, kind of 
weird slang and like putting another layer of the, oh Robert's your mother's brother I was like oh Bob's your uncle I get it so like I said it's kind of like and Cockney rhyming slang is kind of like that too where it's like what they'll do is they'll take a word that is supposed to be you know like um I don't know like stairs and they'll make a phrase that's usually two words that rhymes with that yeah so, I don't understand it and then so then they'll just refer to it the, but just by using the first word I'm not explaining it that good no um, you're not. But <laughs> they'll, be, they'll they did that in the last movie they're in the car and they started talking and the guy just said something that didn't make any goddamn sense <laughs> and Jenny says uh, what he meant was is this Cause it, and it was he, it, and it was a sentence that rhymed with that yeah Cockney and, rhyming slang yeah which is like a, it's a way uh, some kind of old fashioned British way I don't know maybe it's not even old fashioned it's a British way of getting away with saying something you can't say it maybe somebody might overhear you so you say a sentence that rhymes with the other sentence now he did. I and did. It, to me, it didn't really rhyme. It Jenny doesn't all. It, it well, it, it doesn't always. And it, it, sometimes it rhymes in British English, but not in American yeah, English like, because we pronounce things slightly different. Yeah. They didn't use a lot of it in this. So I it's did. A code. I think it, it is kind of, and I think that's how it started out. Yeah. But I mean, it's not a code anymore because everybody knows it. But uh, well, not everybody. But I mean, kind of everybody over there, like, kind of knows. But I think the only British or Cockney rhyming slang I heard in this one was. I think Bullet Tooth Tony said porky pies at one point, which means lies. But usually they would just say porkies. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Pork pies is what the phrase is. But they would just say porkies, and that means lies. So, do, you know, you're telling me porkies. That's what they would say. And I think that he said another one, too, but I can't, because I remember, like, thinking of it, but I didn't, I, now I can't remember what it is. But that was just the first one that came to mind. I'm always, like, fascinated by, that's why I'm always fascinated by, like, British slang and stuff, because... I think their slang is a lot more creative than ours um, because they're they're super into like wordplay and puns and all this other kind of stuff. And it's like really interesting to me because I'm really into language and, yeah. and shit like that. So it's like it's not in Southern it's a lot more literate, yeah. you know, so I find it like a lot more interesting and like funnier than our slang. Our slang is usually kind of just like it's very much in your face. Yeah, you know, not always. I kind of feel like with yeah. the advent of internet slang, it's kind of gotten a more creative, I feel like, because it's more crowdsourced, I guess. Yeah. But American culture didn't play out that way. It's it's not Southern. It definitely wasn't Wild West. You couldn't do that. You had to be careful what you said, and you had to be clear. Being plain spoken was a way of keeping yourself out of a lot of trouble. So I think you're dealing with an armed population. All right. Um, if you're too witty... A person, especially if they've been drinking, might consider, might read into what you said. Just, uh, he insulted me, and then they'd kill you. So you had to be real plain and polite, and you uh, you could you don't want to say anything that would have alternate interpretations. You could get hurt. So I don't think those cultures, American culture, kind of prevented a, the cowboys said that you must ride, shoot straight, and speak the truth. That's fucking basically... So, witty, being witty might be misinterpreted as lying. So it's, I just don't think... You know, I mean, it's just a cultural it's difference. It's a cultural thing, yeah. It was just... I kind of feel like, you know, if, ever since... Well, shit, I was going to say going back to Oscar Wilde, but I'm yeah. sure it was, like, way before that. But so, wittiness or being, like, well-spoken was always something that... Or, yeah. or having, like, a clever right. play with words was always, like, something that was more valued. Yeah. Like, over there, you know? Yeah. Plus, also, America was always pretty much uh, a place where class systems were kind of frowned upon. People didn't like being in other classes. And showing off high degrees of education could get you hurt. I think that's another thing. You go down to a poor, say, mining town... And show off fucking high literary skills in a bar, they'll beat you up. <laughs> you know, that's why they're all up in New York. And shit. <laughs> well, the thing Kill about it. it though is that some stuff like Cockney rhyming slang and stuff like that is very much a working class. Yeah, that was a very bottom up. Yeah, that sounded like something to evade the police. I think that's how it started out. Yeah. It, it started out among kind of like yeah. the criminal underworld where they were like, just trying to like make. A code. Yeah, it was like a code yeah. where they were trying to like use words yeah you know well, they um, do that here too you know what i mean fucking a, a lot of slang yeah is a is a way of talking about a drug without actually saying the word the, you know what i mean uh um a lot of gangster slang is like that 
I don't know any of the new stuff, but back in the old days, you just, all you do is put in a rap record and fucking half of it was fucking code. Yeah. So it's the same kind. It's the same yeah. kind of thing. I don't. I don't think it's quite as different as you know, particularly something like that, which, like I said, very much came from the yeah. working classes or the criminal underclasses. Yeah. Uh, Tyler, the guy said, if sarcasm got you killed in the Old West, then my ass would be dead in the yeah. first five minutes. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Well, because that's the thing. I just can't. You couldn't insult somebody unless you were ready to fucking fight. Or, you know. I mean, I just can't help yeah. it. Like, sometimes I don't really mean to be a smart ass, but it's yeah. just kind of like, that's just how it comes out. Because <laughs> yeah. that's, my whole family is like that. And it's just like, that's just kind of how we interact with one another. So that's just kind of like. Everything I say kind of comes out like that. I can't help it. Yeah, America was not lawless. Even the Old West was not lawless. Its its rates of violence in towns were lower than modern rates of violence. But outside of town on the range, there wasn't any law out there. It would be the same as being at sea, like, a, like in international waters. Dudes did all kinds of shit. And you had to... It was kind of like... Uh, you had to play it cool out there. You had to be a good judge of character. And you had to try to get along with a lot of people. There was, uh, you know, there was Indians out there that you could trade with, but you could also get killed by them, you know. Um, and the Indians were fighting each other, and white dudes were fighting each other, and white guys and Mexican cowboys were fighting. It just depended on where you were. And, but they also got along. It was just a mixture. It was just chaos, you know, just depending on the situation. But if you were out there in the fucking field, I call it the field nowadays, but on the range, that's what they would call it, and you insulted somebody, and he didn't like it, there's no law enforcement, and everybody's got guns, that dude fucking kill you, you know, just the way it was, it's still kind of like that, look at some of those uh, modern westerns that some of these people send us, uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of places in the United States that are still kind of like the, kind of like, uh, you know, they're, they are in the wilderness, so it's going to be kind of an old west kind of situation. Yeah, kind of. Well, Mississippi was an anarchy for fucking <laughs> its whole existence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's no cops. Well, at least not out in, in the middle of nowhere. But yeah, so um, anyway, so this is this was a fucking great movie. I like I said, I saw this back when it came out, and I hadn't seen it again since then. So I was actually really excited that you sent it because I'd been wanting yeah. to revisit it and like I said it was much funnier than I remembered because I didn't re I had forgotten about all the stuff like with the dog like eating the diamond and I just like I forgot about all of the little intricacies about the plot I remembered Brad Pitt like being a boxer and I kind of remembered that and I kind of remembered some of the heist type of stuff and I, I also forgot too like how everything came together at the end which I really liked like how the all the plot threads came together I really liked that which kind of happened in Lockstock too but I think it was like more satisfying in this one in a way that I'm not can't quite put my finger on but um but yeah are you ready to uh wrap it up yep all right so tomorrow is Monday which means it's time for Haunting Mondays once again. And we're going to be doing uh, Season 5, Episode 10, I think it is, and it's called Death's Door. So Sounds that's familiar. the one that we're going to be talking about tomorrow. Yeah. Also, right after we finish up here, I actually did a video this weekend that I just recorded and edited, and I covered the whole entire first season of Rod Serling's Night Gallery, except for the pilot. That was like a different, I, I made a separate video about that like a long time ago, but I actually bought like all the Night Gallery, like the box set of all three seasons. So I actually watched this first season, which was six episodes, so it's like 17 stories. And I did a video about it today and it turned out being like an hour and 20 minutes long, like after it was edited, which I didn't realize, but okay. So, um, but yeah, so it's all edited. So I'm probably going to put it up um, you know, in the next, so it'll probably be up like this evening sometime. And I'm putting that up over on my Scare Salon channel. So if you don't have a, if you're not subscribed over there, then you need to go over and subscribe, uh, over there and then you can watch it, but I'll probably post it. I'll post it on Facebook and, um, and, uh, like on the, in the YouTube community tab and all that other kind of stuff like I usually do. So, you know, if you want to <coughs> see me talk about the first season of Night Gallery for an hour and 20 minutes, then... You're in luck today. You know what I mean? All right. So uh, have a good rest of your Sunday evening, you guys. And thank you for dropping by. And we'll talk to you guys again tomorrow night. Good night.